Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. And we wanted to discuss today, this is our 11th interview, so I've been so many interviews before, but we wanted to discuss today the influence on younger architects, digital architects, the, also the future of architecture. Maybe to begin with the beginning, Patrick Schumacher, who is also here today, wrote this wonderful book, which I reread last night, um, uh, about digital hadith. And uh, in, in this book, uh, there is a lot about your practice pre-digital and then the arriving of the digital. Can you maybe tell us what the digital changed within, within the practice? When did it change? What it changed, how it changed? Um, I mean, I'm sure it changed, but I don't know uh, exactly how. <laughs> Do you remember the, the first year? Uh, or no, the first? I, mean, I, I actually, to be honest, I resisted uh, digital because I felt at the time that uh, all my discoveries was done through, through drawing technique and, uh, you know, that kind of observation. So um, despite some of the people in the office wanting us to use, not, not for 2D, but for uh, three-dimensional explorations, um, I resisted it because I thought it was really kind of cut short. But I think um, when we became very involved in the technology, um, it has made it, uh, well, let me go back. I think what was uh, interesting in a way what we, um, we decided, even with hand drawings, that drawing plans and sections was not enough to explore uh, maybe new thinking in architecture. Yeah. So it became very, in a simple term, so it became difficult to actually explore three-dimensional projections. So that was, um, and I think that's a radical change in architecture. From uh, the only possibility to do two-dimensional work to doing 3D, and now because of digital, you can you can immediately do a three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. You know, you can look at the object as a 3D or a city, or whatever it may be. And so the, it was a reversal of the tradition of how people analyze architecture through <coughs> sections and plans. And now it's the opposite, where you know it's done three-dimensionally, and you only achieve the plan section, and you know through let's say sections of the building. So that's one. The other thing, it is. Um, because of this facility, you can actually um, have a, a much a more immediate idea about what you're trying to do, even if it changes constantly. So that was, again, a very exciting. But the most important is the seamlessness in which you can achieve, uh, you can start from the single idea to uh, development three-dimensional model to, if it's a piece of furniture, to making the furniture, if it's, um, you know, through uh, engineering, it's done at the same time. I think this simultaneity of all the fields uh, come together and the ease in which this information is transferred from one um, time to the other. You know, before, you know, all architects would draw plans and, you know, maybe you get a, somebody to do a 3D drawing or perspective and that then is, you know, printed and sent to the engineers. And you know, and through that process, there is uh, maybe sometimes discrepancies or misunderstanding. And it, of course, made it very much easier for us to achieve complexity through computing because the, the, the trans, this transport of ideas is much more seamless all the way to the to the contractor, you know, in a sense. So that that same file can uh, people always misunderstand some of the kind of critics. Oh, you know, it was only possible to achieve this thing because of the computer, because they think, you know, as a designer, you're an idiot, and you press a button, and the computer is going to design it for you. Of course, I mean, we're talking about, you know, really major writers in England writing for The Guardian or, or The Times um, saying uh, utter nonsenses like that, uh, not understanding anything about um, the process. So I think the process, although very different, is the most important and it's the most exciting. Uh, you know, uh, you can, for some parents, you can, you know, design a shoe or you can design an artwork or you can design a building. But of course, there are other layers uh, of complexity added to the way you make it. You know, and and uh, but I still think, in simple terms, that's the exciting part. You know, that it can, you can 
go from that kind of uh, engineering the columns, engineering in this room, the fabrication of the of the tensile structure. Uh, you know, all of these things uh, are done through this this similar models of computing. Now, in the book which Patrick wrote, there is this chapter with the digital sort of focusing a lot on Rome as a, a new digitally based architectural language, and obviously something uh, which you did already earlier. Without the digital kind of incomplete compositions, um, complexity, um, uh, all of you that, can, but uh, something. You can ask him, he's standing. <laughs> he, he's there. Yeah, yeah, but it's, uh, I, uh, that, that's always great if Patrick joins us, but it would be great to hear from you what if something changed with Rome, because... Um, well, I think Rome was uh, kind of the last of the sort of non-digital projects. Yeah. I mean, what was done, you know, the, the, the fluidity started maybe earlier, so, but I, I suppose Rome could have done all done by, it was all sketched by hand. I mean, it was also sketched by, uh, by computer, but it's done as a kind of um, analog project uh, in a way, because it's kind of much more linear. And, uh, but the seed of uh, the layering was there, you know, like how each layer yeah. is superimposed and read at the same time, or, uh, but with that then being completely compressed in one single space. So, um, so I think it was like the, la the last thesis of that early period. So it's the beginning and the end of something in well, some way. It, it, only in the, in the beginning it was big, uh, because you know we did draw the drawings was at the time also done through computing, but um, it was the uh, the beginning of the fluid project, but uh, towards the end of the linear project. If you see, what I'm saying they. It happens at the happen at the same time. And maybe it's great to come into the present. And I was thinking, as we're here in this amazing space and we talk about process, if you can maybe tell us a little bit about the process of the building here and how how it all started and uh, yeah, that also the process, uh, the process change is not based anymore. That you know, one of us will do a sketch and the sketch, you know, is translated into sort of a more elaborate sketch and then it has an idea. I think now. The prayers all is all kind of also simultaneous or much more immediate. And um, well, you know, I think that you know you have an existing building, um, which is um, uh, existing magazine building. And how do you attach another uh, structure next to it? And uh, and. Um, so I well I we we, th we we thought it should be a very light, a very light piece. So hence, the tensile structure, and um, and I think it, th this building is in terms of engineering is very exciting because uh, because you know the columns, um, I mean the structure is on the edge, which is the bent beam, mm -hmm. and it lands on three places, and then it holds uh, the fabric which is fabric, fabricated to fit the roof and held by these kind of columns. So there was really very minimal kind of structural uh, presence. And um, there was an interesting letter written, sent, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure you've seen it. Uh, was it written by Peter Cook to the, yeah, I read it, yeah, to yeah. the, to to the building paper. design, uh, saying, you know, and it's true, if I, I actually, my, my response was to uh, do and the way we work in the office, we always think of, you know, 20 options. Mm -hmm. And I was going to make 20 options and send them to BD, uh, just for the fun of it. Uh, so I think it's a kind of very, it was supposed to be very light, uh, the way it's attached to the existing building. But it also gives you a completely different sense of, sense of space, in a, different from the uh, neighboring house. So that was really um, the idea of this room, one, one large room. And in terms of the tensile structure, I remember um, you often told me about uh, Fry Otto, and uh, because you mentioned Peter Cook, it's very interesting to also talk about Fry Otto. Yeah, Fry Otto. I mean, it's interesting because I was interviewed two days ago for a film on him, yeah. and um, I mean, I think that was very uh, valid, interesting work. Uh, and when I joined the AA in the seventies, there was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, about tensile. It was a kind of because uh, everybody was talking at the time about alternative life, you know, all the other alternative to, you know, of course, they don't forget, you know, the computing was already there through Gordon Pask, who used to do operas of, for, with, a, with a water computer, 
uh, you know, it was like it was a very, it was a very funny, interesting. I mean, have you seen his movies? Yes, I, yeah, I, yeah. Cedric Price always talked about Gordon Pass. He, he because he was a cybernetician advisor on the Fan Pass. Yes, somehow. he was. Yeah. Yes, but it, they used to do them at the AA uh, yeah. prior to my time, actually. Uh, and I did, never understood the idea of the water computer, but anyway. Um, so, um, but anyway, that was there. So there was this discussion with uh, with there were these ideas floating around at the at the time. But Tensai was very very big and. Uh, but I don't think, I mean, there were interests, and then they did them in places where, you know, the weather permits, like in, you know, Saudi Arabia, or, you know, for the airport, or the southern palaces. Um, you know, that, so I think that it was, was there. But I think what is now interesting is that, you know, one can really perfect uh, the patterning and, and the engineering. Also, experimentation, I mean, Fayotto did all these books about all kinds of physical experiments and almost like in a laboratory and uh, you mentioned that once to me, that sort of idea of yeah, I mean, endless uh, experimentation. We, we, as a uh, well, I don't think one should do experimentation for the sake of it. I mean, it was a very fashionable topic, experimentation, about, you know, 20 years ago. Like, you know, everybody who has no idea thought it'd be experimenting. You know, so to end up with a bad experiment. Uh, but, but, um, yeah, there was lots of uh, there was some yeah interesting stuff. Now we talked about uh, Peter Cook and we talked about the uh, about Friotto. I mean, one of the things I thought in the context here of eighty nine plus because we were also in Munich. In terms I mean, of a lot of, you know, did a lot of research in Vienna in my, yeah. in, and when I'm when I'm teaching at the Angewandte, where on on all the you know shell structure and tensile, not just Friotto. So it was uh, it's been a very interesting take to how do you. How do you kind of really reinterpret that uh, in, in, in with current yeah. uh, technology? And that actually connects to, to Austria, because it is in Austria that you and Patrick curated this show very early on about a young kind of generation of uh, digital uh, architects. How do you connect to a younger generation of, of architects? Is that something which is ongoing? Or? Well, I mean, through teaching. I, mean, I was yeah. teaching at Yale, and I was teaching. Uh, half of my office is very young. Uh, you know, and I actually connect to them maybe better than the older ones. Um, not because they do what I want, <coughs> but I think they, all, because also of the training, they're much more versatile, and, um, and all the older ones are mostly men. I had to bring that up, and they are, after a certain age, um, they get worse. <laughs> and their and their stubbornness, so um, you know it's much much more interesting to deal. And also, there is tremendous amount of enthusiasm amongst well, you know, a lot of people. It doesn't matter about age, uh, you know. But I think a lot of enthusiasm amongst the young to discover, in this case, through architecture and matched with the technology, uh, new ideas and uh, new form, and to achieve. Um, to kind of really overcome certain, uh, do certain projects. I mean, from a, you know, it's, it's a, a very rewarding, I think, for a, somebody in their late 20s, early 30s to work on a, on a major airport or a stadia or, and also they win these competitions. You know, we haven't won the airport yet, but, uh, you know, so I think it's a very, um, it's very rewarding and, and exciting uh, that these, uh, these efforts and these people work extremely hard uh, these efforts uh, not only manifest through a winning her project, but they are contributing to the making of her certain project. And and I the same I would say the same mm -hmm. with the team who works on Baku, which uh, you know was quite difficult. Which is just about to open. No? Which is about to open in uh, no, in ten days. <clears throat> and so these most of these the teams are you know maybe except for the lead, which are also very young, are quite young and. Have not, not done a project before, but I think it, that uh, gives them the chance to be incredibly diligent and also contribute their own their own to these these things. Now we have in the program booklets different kind of letters. We have a letter to a young poet by Etel Adnan, a letter to a young philosopher by Mary Mitchley, and that obviously comes from Rainer Maria Rilke, who did the famous booklet, which is the kind of advice to a young poet, and I was very curious about in 2013, would be kind of your advice to a young architect? 
Oh, well, I suppose it would be the same I would have said 20 years ago. It's, it's, uh, architecture is uh, incredibly uh, demanding. So, I mean, apart from, you have to work very hard. I think you should also leave, I mean, open to uh, new ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think skill is very important, uh, especially with computing. I mean, if you, if, I mean, I don't have any knowledge myself how to do anything on the computer. Uh, but I think for a younger person, the skill and the training is extremely important. And unfortunately, in London, there are not many schools which give you that skill. Maybe now, I mean, the graduate school in the AA is uh, interested in complexity and, and all that scripting and computing and maybe bits of the botnet. But in generally speaking, uh, somebody, some kid has gone to a, you know, some, one of the schools in London or in the provinces, uh, they're not so, uh, after five years. And I know that it's, I mean, the, the students in Vienna, for example, when we arrived there 10, 15, 12 years ago, um, they hardly knew nothing. And now they are very good, they know all the programs. And it was the same thing when you, people knew how to draw or make a model. You know, you move faster uh, if you are a versatile and you are able to do things quite quickly, you know, that doesn't mean that you only know how to make things, but it, even in terms of thinking, it makes it quicker for practice. <coughs> and I think practice, like in any profession, whether it's music or conducting or dance or sport or whatever it may be, practice is very, practicing is very important. I have one last question that I've asked you many times before is the question about <coughs> unrealized projects. And we started interviews about 15 years ago, a big percentage of, of, uh, of your work was unrealized. And now, so many, many, many buildings are, are realized and being built. I was kind of wondering what today are uh, you know, projects of yours which are dreams, uh, what maybe things you haven't been able to build yet? Um, well, I mean, a, I mean a topic or a, a, a what? what? Uh, I don't know, I don't, I mean, I think that, I still think that this project which I did 20 years ago, which were not built, were for me as valuable as the ones, you know, the only difference is that, I, of course, you know, um, there is no substitute for the way you experience space, uh, you know, through mm -hmm. the, real, real, the real space. Uh, no matter how many times I drew it up, it was, it's never the same. Uh, you know, you can't predict everything you see through it. Um, I don't know, I mean, I still think, um, in terms of urbanism, there hasn't been a project on a large enough scale that you have, you know, the impact of uh, certain ideas are on that cityscape. You know, like if you, if one talks about uh, porosity, uh, common ground, and all those things, I mean, these are just words, but actually in practice, how you would we achieve um, these things through architecture or a large project, and I think that they're only possible if there is some other land land reform <coughs> that allows you to have a kind of a overall idea about a bigger site. Uh, but in, apart from that, you know, we'd, I mean, I also, I mean, I think that what has been interesting is that we focus also on infrastructure. I mean, so infrastructure, architecture, and I think it helped us a lot deal with the engineering of the building because there are some of them who had to infrastructural kind of ideas. Um, and I think it is a very exciting moment now that, um, you know, really, I feel you can do anything you want, given that you know that how to make it. And when Julia invited you in 2000 to do uh, the first pavilion, which is the beginning of the Serpentine Pavilion project, that was the first <coughs> building uh, in London. Obviously, now there are buildings in London. However, this is the very first uh, permanent building in central London. And you once told me a couple of months ago that maybe London is somehow an unrealized project because there are so many experiments in relation to London which haven't yeah, happened. Well, well, but, you know, I mean, I, I must have thousands of projects for London because every time I, I drive through town, I see an empty site, I think it's an idea for a site. Or uh, if I see an ugly building, I think it's just a shame. <laughs> it would have been nice if it was different. So I have about thousands of. <laughs> Uh, projects for London, but you know I'm assured I will not build here. You know, so I don't have to worry 
Uh, <clears throat> and you know, maybe it's okay, because you know, I was very privileged to build in other places, and um, people liked it, and I would have gone through hell here for 20 years. And um, they don't have to have one of those things uh, they don't like. Um, so I'm, not, I'm assured that um, I'll be spared the constant agony of reading the critics about <laughs> about every project we do. We can't, you know, I mean, it's just. So that's why they end up with um, such awful stuff, uh, you know, in all of us, crapped all over London, whether it's frying people or, you know, whatever. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's really a, um, a shame. And because I think they're also to do with, you know, certain planning policies. Um, I mean, if you just travel through town and there are so many now empty sites, with the potential of making some interesting projects. They don't have to be wild or crazy. I mean, lots of people can exist in the same uh, domain. Um, because I, but maybe, you know, London is a great city and, uh, you know, maybe it's, it, it doesn't need a great architecture. But it is wonderful to be in this great building here and listen to you, Zaha. Thank you so very, thank you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.